Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Let's move to the next hadith in the next chapter talking about how the muhajir is permitted to stay for three days in Mecca after the Hajj and the Umrah. From Al-Ala al-Hadrami that the Prophet والسلام, said يقيم المهاجر بمكة بعد قضاء نسكه ثلاثة that after completing the rites of the Hajj or the Umrah the muhajir can stay at Mecca for three days and nights. So the immediate question is why should this be the case? And the answer is that the muhajir has left Mecca for al Madina. And when you leave something for the sake of Allah, you do not return to it. Just like a charity. If you give charity and you take it back, then you are like a dog who tries to eat back its vomit. And of course that's a filthy sight. And we can make analogy and say that it is not restricted to Mecca. Any person who leaves Darul Kufr to emigrate to Darul Islam is not allowed to return back to that place which he has left except for three days this is a slight leeway given and some flexibility and this would be for a particular need so in this case for the people of Mecca it would be for tijara or trade purposes because the Hajj season would also be a great opportunity for trade and that is permissible and it is for this reason that the Prophet felt sorry and sad for the Sahabi Sa'ad ibn Khawla radiallahu an who actually died in Mecca after having made Hijrah from Mecca to Medina because then when he returned to Mecca he died there so he died in a place which he left for the sake of Allah Jalla wa ala. and that is a bitter irony we may also take from this narration that the Tawaful Wada is not from the rites of the Hajj because the last thing that you want to do before leaving Mecca is the Tawaful Wada but this narration talks about the fact that you can stay for three days after completing your rituals ba'da qada'i nusuke so the point is you could commit your rituals stay for three days and then make tawaf al wada' at the end of the third day as you leave that means that the tawaf al wada' is not from the inherent rituals of the hajj or the umrah nevertheless we do say it is wajib because of the firm order that has been issued okay let's take a look at the next chapter about the sanctity of makkah from ibn abbas that the Prophet said on the Yawm al-Fatih when Makkah was conquered لا هجرة ولكن جهاد ونية There is no hijrah anymore but rather there still remains the obligation of fighting and having the intention to go out if called upon وَإِذَا اسْتُنْفِرْتُمْ فَانْفِرُوا And when you are called out then go out Also the Prophet went on to say إِنَّ هَذَا الْبَلَدْ حَرَّمَهُ اللَّهُ يَوْمَ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ فَهُوَ حَرَامٌ بِحُرْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ This city, meaning Mecca, Allah made it haram or sacred the day He created the heavens and the earth. So it is sacred by the sanctity of Allah up till يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ وَإِنَّهُ لَمْ يَحِلَّ الْقِتَالُ فِيهِ لِأَحَدٍ قَبْلِ وَلَمْ يَحِلَّ لِي إِلَّا سَاعَةً مِنْ نَهَارِ فَهُوَ حَرَامٌ بِحُرْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ And fighting was never allowed in it for anyone before me. And it was only allowed for me for part of the day. So it is sacred with the sanctity of Allah up till Yawm Al Qiyamah. La yu'adhu shawku. Its thorns are not to be cut off. Wa la yunaffaru saydu. Its game animals are not even to be disturbed. Wa la yiltaqidu illa man arrafaha. And no one should pick up the lost property in that place except the one who is going to forever on announce it. وَلَا يُخْتَلَى خَلَاهَا And its grass or herbage should not be cut. فَقَالَ الْعَبَّاسِ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْإِذْخِرِ فَإِنَّهُ لِقَيْنِهِمْ وَلِبُيُوتِهِمْ فَقَالَ إِلَّا الْإِذْخِرِ But then to this, Al-Abbas, the Prophet's uncle said, O Messenger of Allah, make an exception for the lemon grass because it is used for the blacksmith of Medina and also for their homes. And so the Prophet said, accept the lemon grass. In another wording of the chapter, the Prophet says that if anyone seeks justification to fight in the Haram because the Prophet did, then tell them that Allah allowed the Prophet and has not allowed you. And the companion Abu Shuraih narrated this narration to Amr ibn Sa'id, who was one of the governors at the time when Yazid wanted to fight and eventually kill Abdullah ibn Zubair, who sought protection in the Haram. And Amr ibn Sa'id said to Abu Shuraih that Mecca does not provide protection 
for the one who is sinning or the one who is fleeing from a crime. Also in a narration, after the Prophet uttered these words, a man from Yemen called Abu Shah said, O Messenger of Allah, write this down for me. And the Prophet ordered that these words of advice from the Prophet be written down for Abu Shah. So we learn from these narrations that the Haram of Makkah is sacred. So certain things in that place are forbidden, which normally would not be forbidden in other places. The Prophet says that Allah made Makkah Haram. In another narration coming up, we find that Ibrahim السلام, made Makkah Haram. So how do we reconcile? We reconcile by saying Ibrahim السلام, merely declared Makkah to be Haram. But the one who actually makes anything haram is Allah Jalla wa'ala. No human can make anything sacred, but a human can declare it to be sacred after receiving the evidence from Allah Jalla wa'ala. It's like if someone makes takfir of someone else, he declares him to be a kafir, but he did not make him into a kafir. What makes you into a kafir is if you commit an act of major kufr without any excuse. That is what made you into a kafir. But if you make takfir on someone, you did not make him into a kafir, you declared him to be a kafir. It's the same way with hadith scholars, they declare a hadith to be sahih. They cannot make a hadith to be sahih. That's impossible. When the Prophet says that there is no hijrah, he means no hijrah from Makkah to Medina because at that time, Makkah had been conquered and become the land of the Muslims. So no need for hijrah. However, we find from other narrations that hijrah will continue up till the tawbah would not be accepted and that will be when the sun rises from the west. So making hijrah from a land of kufr to a land of Islam is always applicable right till the end of time. And he tells us that military expeditions will always be applicable when the time is right and when you're called upon you must go out and march out and this is an obligation if you're called upon. There is an indication in this that Makkah will not become a place of kufr after it has become a place of Islam. Because if it were to become a place of kufr, then hijrah would be obligatory again. And yet the Prophet is saying there is no hijrah after the conquest. This hadith agrees with the ayat of Surah Al Imran. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu ma lakum idha qila lakum unfiru fi sabili Allah fa qaltum ila al ard. Arraditum bil hayat al dunya min al akhira. Fama mata' al hayat al dunya fi al akhira illa qalil. Illa tamfiru yu'adhibukum adhaban alima. He teaches us that if you do not march out, he will punish you and will replace you with another people. We also find from this narration the evidence of naskh or abrogation because Makkah was haram, then was made halal for a short while and then was made haram again up till Yawm Al-Qiyamah. But no one is allowed to say, well, the Prophet fought in it, so therefore I will fight as well. The Prophet made it extremely clear that it was only made halal for him for part of the day. Some scholars say it was from sunrise to Asr time. And we also find one of the khasais of the Prophet that he was allowed to fight in Makkah. We find that the game animals of the Haram, far from actually being killed, are not even allowed to be disturbed. So for example, a pigeon is sitting near you and you intentionally wave your hands to shoo it away. This is impermissible because you're not even allowed to disturb the game animal. As for if you catch a game animal outside the Haram and bring it inside the Haram, be it the Haram of Makkah or Medina, then that is permissible. It's not the same thing. Also, the natural vegetation, the grass and the trees are not to be cut. If you plant something yourself, that can be cut. It's not the same thing. Also, the lost items on the floor are not to be picked up, except by the one who will forever run announce it. Now, nobody would want that type of responsibility. And so this is there to encourage people not to pick up the items. Nowadays, we could find lost property offices and there would be no problem in depositing those items there. If you fear that somebody else may pick it up and not respect the sanctity of the haram. So lost property offices are a good idea in the haram. But does this rule apply to even pretty much worthless items such as, for example, a pen? It is not likely that somebody is going to return looking for his pen. If you lose a pen, you can just purchase a new one. Now one could argue that the rule is general for all and every lost property. Or you could argue that the lost property which is intended is the one for which the owner is likely to come back looking for. And this appears to be the weightier opinion and Allah knows best. That if for example you see a small thing which is 
not worth much, let's say a pen or maybe a date or something which the owner is not going to come back looking for, then you can pick that up. It's not a problem. It's the more valuable items that we are dealing with here. We may also take that you can make an exception without having intended it at the beginning of the speech because the Prophet did not intend the idhkhir at the start of his speech. And this is the weightier of the scholarly opinions. The idhkhir is used by the blacksmiths because it catches fire quickly and it was also used to put in the roofs of their homes at that time. We also find Abu Shuraih radiallahu an speaking to the leader at that time, Amr ibn Sa'id, with etiquettes. Even though Abu Shuraih is better and more virtuous than Amr because Abu Shuraih is a companion and Amr is not. As for the argument of Amr, that the haram does not protect the sinner or the criminal, then he is wrong, because it does. As long as you committed the crime outside the haram and then came in, it does protect you. If you commit the crime in the haram, then it does not protect you because you yourself broke the sanctity of the haram. We also take that it is permissible to write down the hadith of the Prophet, as he permitted it to be written down for Abu Shah. Also we know that Abdul ibn Amr used to write down the hadith as well. And because of this he knew more hadith than Abu Hurairah. We also have the Sahifa of Ali radiallahu an, which has written in it matters of blood money and that the prisoner should be freed and that a kafir is not killed for a Muslim. But what if someone says that writing down anything other than the Quran was haram in the beginning as the Prophet ordered? The answer is yes. And this would be for two reasons which are possible. Firstly, so that nothing else gets mixed up with the Qur'an. But afterwards, this was abrogated when it was clear what the Qur'an is and what is not the Qur'an. One may also argue that this was to encourage people to memorize and not to resort to writing things down. In any case, we have an abrogation situation. Okay, let us move to the next narration about the forbiddance of carrying weapons in Mecca. From Jabir that the Prophet said, لا يحل لأحدكم أن يحمل بمكة السلاح. It is not permissible for any one of you to carry weapons in Mecca. And the reason for this should be clear because Mecca is a place of safety, and if everyone is carrying weapons around, then it could create fear. So the ultimate aim is safety. Now, for that reason, the authorities could allow police officers to carry weapons in order to ensure safety. It is also permissible to have weapons in your home because you may need them for defense. But as for everyone carrying it around in the streets and so on, then this is impermissible. The next chapter about entering Makkah without being in the state of Ihram. From Anas ibn Malik, he reports that the Prophet entered Makkah in the year of the conquest wearing a helmet. And when the Prophet removed the helmet, a man came to him saying, Ibn Khatal is hanging on to the cloth of the Kaaba. And the Prophet said, Uqtulu, kill him. So we find here that being in a state of ihram is only for the one who wants to perform the Hajj or the Umrah. And this is clear cut in the narration of the Mawaqeet, where the Prophet said, Hunna lahunna wa liman ata alayhinna min ghayli ahlihinna liman arada al Hajj or al Umrah. For the one who wants to perform the Hajj or the Umrah. Which means if you do not wish to perform the Hajj or the Umrah, you do not need to be in the state of ihram. It's as simple as that. As for killing Ibn Khatal, he was a person who embraced Islam, then became a murtad, and in the conquest, he hung on to the clothing of the Kaaba, seeking protection, but the Kaaba could not protect him, because this was a time in which fighting was allowed for the Prophet, only for that limited amount of time which we spoke before, and it would not be allowed for anyone after the Prophet. Also in the chapter, from Jabir ibn Abdullah, he says that the Prophet entered Mecca in the year of the conquest and he was wearing a black turban, Imama Sauda, and he was not in the Ihram, Bughayri Ihram. So at that time it so happened to be black, otherwise turbans could be pretty much any color. However, if black turbans were to, let's say, become an emblem of a certain group of bid'ah, then we would not wear this so as not to imitate them. The next chapter is about the virtues of al Madina al Nabawiyyah, or what is nowadays called al Madina al Munawwara, from Abdullah ibn Zayd ibn Asim, that the Prophet said, Inna Ibrahima harrama Makkah wa da'a li ahliha, wa inni harramtu al Madina kama harrama Ibrahimu Makkah, wa inni da'utu 
في ساعها ومدها بمثلي ما دعا به إبراهيم لأهل مكة Ibrahim declared Makkah to be sacred and made dua for its people. And indeed, I declare al Madina to be sacred just like Ibrahim declared Makkah to be sacred and I made dua for its sa' and its mud twice as much as Ibrahim made dua for the people of Makkah. We find from this narration that sanctuaries or the haram of Makkah and Medina are sacred, but Makkah is more sacred than al Madina. There is no jaza for hunting the game animals of al Madina, yet there is for Makkah. As for cutting off the naturally grown trees, then there is no fidya to be paid in either case, according to the correct opinion, but the trees in Makkah are not to be cut off except for a necessity, whereas in al Madina they can be cut off for a need, and a need is less than a necessity. Remember also, it is Allah Jalla wa ala who makes places sacred, Prophets merely declare the sanctity. They do not create the sanctity. We also find that the food measurements in al Madina are blessed because of the dua of the Prophet ﷺ. The sa' and the mud were the ways to measure the food because you had to be accurate when you measure things out, otherwise people could cheat each other. In the chapter also, the Prophet says, What is between the labitayha is haram. These are the two lava plains. There must have been a volcanic eruption at some point creating lava rocks and this is east and west of al Madina. As for north and south then there are two mountains al Air and al Thawr. So what is between these places is sacred. Beyond those places is not the sanctity. And so the same rules apply about not picking up lost items and the game animals should not be disturbed and the natural vegetation should not be cut and also weapons should not be carried around. Also in the chapter from Amir ibn Sa'ad, reporting from his father, that the Prophet said, إِنِّي أُحَرِّمُ مَا بَيْنَ لَابِتَيْ الْمَدِينَةِ أَنْ يُقْطَعَ عِضَاهُهَا أَوْ يُقْتَلَ صَيْدُهَا وقال المدينة خير لهم لو كانوا يعلمون لا يدعها أحد رغبة عنها إلا أبدل الله فيها من هو خير من ولا يثبت أحد على لأوائها وجهدها إلا كنت له شفيعا أو شهيدا يوم القيامة I declare sacred what is between the two lava plains that its plantation should not be cut off nor that its game animals should be killed and he also went on to say Medina is better for them if they but knew no one would leave Medina out of a dislike for it except that Allah will replace in Medina one who is better than him and no one remains steadfast on the severe hunger suffered in al Medina and the difficulty in living in al Medina, except that I will be an intercessor, or he said, a witness for him on Yawm al Qiyamah. And also from Amr ibn Sa'ad, that the Prophet said, لا يريد أحد أهل المدينة بسوء إلا أذابه الله في النار ذوب الرصاص أو ذوب الملح في الماء. No one intends evil for the people of Medina except that Allah will melt him just like the lead melts or just like the salt dissolves in water. We clearly find from these narrations the Prophet is encouraging people to stay in Al-Madina and this was vital because they found life difficult in Al-Madina when they emigrated from Mecca and we are told that no one leaves out of dislike for Al-Madina except that Allah will replace one who is better than him. In fact, we could make an interesting analogy here and say that Medina is only a place and yet Allah will replace someone who is better than him. So how about then someone who leaves the deen of Islam out of dislike for Islam? Should it not be the case that Allah will even more so, as in a fortiori, replace someone who is better than him? We say yes, absolutely. If this works for al Madina, which is only a place, how about for the deen of Al-Islam? It should work even more so. So the point is we should not feel disheartened that there are people who are leaving Islam. Allah Jalla wa ala will replace them with ones who are better and will serve the deen more effectively. However, if someone leaves for a genuine or noble purpose, then this hadith does not apply to him. Many of the Sahaba left Medina for other places. And so what we say is that the best place for you to be is the place where you will be most beneficial. If you have knowledge, and there is a place which needs people of knowledge, 
then that is the best place for you. We also learn of the virtue of being patient in Medina, whether it is out of severe hunger or just general difficult living conditions. If you can remain firm and have thabat, or firmness and sabr, then the Prophet will be your intercessor or it says a witness for you on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. It's the same thing. He will argue for you on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. We also learn of the harrowing threat of anyone wanting evil for the people of Al-Madinah that Allah will melt him or dissolve him like salt dissolves in water so like that he will be dissolved in the fire of Jahannam so this is a threat but also a virtue of those residing in Al-Madina also in the chapter from Anas ibn Malik that the Prophet said Man ahdatha fiha hadathan fa'alayhi la'natu Allahi wal malaikati wal nasi ajma'in la yaqabalu Allahu minhu yawm al-qiyamati sarfan wa la adla whoever innovates in Medina something then upon him is the curse of Allah and the angels and the whole of mankind. On Yawm Al-Qiyamah, Allah Jalla wa'ala will not accept from him a sarf, which is to turn you away. That is to say, anything which will turn you away from the punishment of Allah. So that will be in terms of your good deeds and your tawbah and so on. Because all of this turns you away from the punishment. So no sarf will be accepted from such a person, nor al-adl. Adal is when you give something in lieu of something else. So that would be a ransom. Also in a wording it says, whoever gives shelter to a muhdith, then he has the same punishment. Also in the chapter from Anas, that the Prophet said, Allahumma barik lahum fi mikyalihim wa barik lahum fi sa'ihim wa barik lahum fi muddihim. Oh Allah, bless them in their mikyal, which is the container to measure out the food, and bless them in their sa', which is a measurement, and bless them in their mud. And four amdad is one sa'. Now, muhdith can mean someone who introduces a bid'ah, but it can also be someone who commits a crime. Both are covered in this hadith. Because ahdatha means to bring about something new. So this could be in a theological sense, but it could also be in a legal sense, as in to bring about something new in terms of a crime. Also, Reported by Aisha radiallahu anha, she says that we came to Al Madina and there was some fever going around. Abu Bakr and Bilal complained of it. When the Prophet found out that people are complaining of this fever, he made dua, Allahumma habib ilayna al Madina ta kama habbabta Makkata aw ashad. Oh Allah, make Al Madina beloved to us just like you did with Makkah or even more so. Wasahiha and granted health. وَبَارِكْ لَنَا فِي سَاعِهَا وَمُدِّهَا And bless us in its sa' and the mud. وَحَوِّلْ حُمَّاهَا إِلَى الْجُحْفَةِ And send its fever away to al-juhfa. And al-juhfa at that time was a place of the kuffar. So we find from this narration that it is permissible to make dua against a kafir nation. And also make dua pertaining to matters of the heart. Look how he says, make al Madina beloved to us, just like Mecca or even more so. What is beloved or not is a matter of the heart. And so you're allowed to make dua to Allah Jalla wa'ala for matters of the heart. Sometimes we find amongst Muslims their heart becomes hardened and they realize this. So the answer is to make dua to Allah Jalla wa'ala to soften your heart to his remembrance. We find this in the Quran as well. Rabbana la tuzigh qulubana ba'da idh hadaytana wa hablana min ladunka rahma innaka anta al-wahhab. Likewise in other hadith, Thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Make my heart firm on your deen. Or for example, sarrif qalbi ala ta'atik. Turn my heart towards your obedience. We also find in the chapter, the Prophet saying about al Madina, La yuhmalu fiha silahun liqital. Weapons are not to be carried therein for fighting. And so this is the same as what he said with Makkah. He also goes on to say, وَلَا تُخْبَضُ فِيهَا شَجَرَةٌ إِلَّا لِعَلَفْ Trees are not to be cut off except for fodder. So you see here that fodder is a need. It's not a necessity because there are alternatives to cutting down the naturally grown trees in al Madina. But it's a genuine need and so you're allowed to cut down branches of naturally growing trees in the Haram of Medina for fodder. Whereas you would not be allowed to do that in Makkah. So the sanctity of Makkah is more severe than that of Al-Madinah. That's an interesting point of difference.
The next chapter about al Madina being guarded from Abu Huraira that the Prophet said, على أنقاب المدينة ملائكة لا يدخلها الطاعون ولا الدجال. On the roads leading to al Madina there are malaika. No plague nor a dajjal will enter it. As far as the dajjal is concerned, his hadith are quite a few and they come towards the end of Sahih Muslim. As far as the ta'un is concerned, this is the disease born about by rats and mice. That will not enter al Madina. So in this there is a fadila of the city of al Madina. It does not mean that other diseases and epidemics cannot enter al Madina. We have just found out that in Medina there was some kind of fever or flu going around. So these types of epidemics can enter al Madina, But what cannot enter is the Ta'un, which is the plague. The next chapter about al Madina wiping out the evil from Abu Huraira that the Prophet said, يَأْتِي عَلَى النَّاسِ زَمَانٌ يَدْعُ الرَّجُلُ إِبْنَ عَمِّهِ وَقَرِيبَهُ هَلُمَّ إِلَى الرَّخَى هَلُمَّ إِلَى الرَّخَى والمدينة خير لهم لو كانوا يعلمون والذي نفس بيده لا يخرج منهم أحد رغبة عنها إلا أخلف الله فيها خيرا منه ألا إن المدينة كالكير تخرج الخبيث لا تقوم الساعة حتى تنفي المدينة شرارها كما ينفي الكير خبث الحديد It will come a time when a person would invite his cousin and his relatives, telling them, come to a luxurious place, come to a luxurious place. But Medina will be better for them if they but knew. But the one who has my soul in his hand, no one leaves this city out of dislike for it or feeling averse to it, but that Allah will replace him with one who is better. Medina is like a furnace which eliminates from it the impurities. The last hour will not be established until Medina banishes its evils, just like a furnace, eliminates the impurities of the iron. Also in the chapter from Abu Huraira that the Prophet said, أُمِرْتُ بِقَرْيَةٍ تَأْكُلُ الْقُرَى يَقُولُونَ يَفْرِبْ وَهِيَ الْمَدِينَةِ تَنْفِي النَّاسَ كَمَا يَنْفِي الْكِيرُ خَبَثَ الْحَدِيدِ I have been ordered to go to a city which will overcome all the other cities. They call it Yathrib. It is al Madina. It eliminates the bad people just like the furnace eliminates the impurities of the iron. We find from this narration that anyone who has evil in his heart and no love for the deen will leave al Madina being averse to it. Of course, this does not include the Sahaba. They did not leave Medina because they were averse. They left Medina because other places would be more useful for them because they could give da'wah and implement the ahkam of the sharia. But al Madina has this peculiar quality is that it will get rid of the filthy or evil people, ones with not much goodness in their heart. And so only the worthy people remain. The Prophet said in the narration that Medina will consume other cities, meaning it will overpower it. And this is exactly what happened when the state was established in al Madina. You found the whole of the Arabian Peninsula entering the deen of al-Islam. Notice here, they call it Yathrib, and this is not a positive name from Tathrib, which means blame or censure someone, as in لا تثريب عليكم اليوم يا غفر الله لكم. There is no blame on you today, may Allah forgive you. And the Prophet said, وهي المدينة. It is al-Madina. So the Prophet changed the name. Therefore, it is not permissible for us to call it Yathrib after the Prophet has changed its name to al Madina. In the Sahih, we also have the name Taiba and Taba for the city of al Madina. Nowadays, it is called al Madina al Munawwara, and this has become the famous title for it. But if they were to call it al Madina al Nabawiyya, it would be better and more accurate. Okay, the next chapter speaks about staying in al Madina and not to be tempted away from it. It has preceded us that the Prophet says no one will leave Medina out of aversion for it except that Allah will replace him with someone who is better. And there's a complimentary hadith here from Sufyan ibn Abu Zuhair that the Prophet said, يُفْتَحُ sham فَيَخْرَجُ مِنَ الْمَدِينَةِ قَوْمٌ بِأَهْلِهِمْ يَبُسُّونَ وَالْمَدِينَةُ خَيْرٌ لَهُمْ لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ 
ثم يفتح اليمن فيخرج من المدينة قوم بأهلهم يبصون والمدينة خير لهم لو كانوا يعلمون ثم يفتح العراق فيخرج من المدينة قوم بأهلهم يبصون والمدينة خير لهم لو كانوا يعلمون He mentions three places that are going to be conquered Al-Sham, Al-Yaman and Al-Iraq and on all three occasions people are going to leave Medina to settle down over there hurrying along with their families and he says Medina is better for them if they but knew The way we are going to understand this hadith is that they are seeking a better life meaning economically and yet the Prophet is saying but Medina is better for them meaning for their deen and their dunya overall better for them as for someone who leaves to seek knowledge or for da'wah purposes as many of the companions did then there is no blame in that in fact it is a praiseworthy act the next chapter speaks about people actually abandoning al Medina from Abu Huraira that the Prophet said about al Medina لا يتركنها أهلها على خير ما كانت مذللة للعوافي يعني السبع والطير he says its inhabitants are going to abandon Medina despite the fact that Medina is perfectly good for them and they will leave it for the awafi and this is explained as the predatory animals and the birds. What appears to be the case is that this hadith is talking about towards the end of times when al Medina will be left as a haunt for the animals. This would make sense because only a person of Iman will stay in al Medina. But at the end of times we know there will be no people of Iman. No one will be even uttering the word Allah. The next narration about the member of the Prophet and his house. From Abu Huraira the Prophet said, مَا بَيْنَ بَيْتِي وَمِنْبَرِي رَوْضَةٌ مِنْ رِيَاضِ الْجَنَّةِ وَمِنْبَرِي عَلَى حَوْضِي What is between my house and my pulpit is a garden from the gardens of Jannah. And my mimbar, my pulpit, is on my hawd, the basin. The first question that comes to mind with this hadith is what is the intended meaning? Well, a decent enough interpretation is to say that the place between the bait and the mimbar will be transformed into one of the gardens of the gardens of Jannah. And then we can interpret the second part of the hadith like that as well, that the place on which there is a mimbar of the Prophet that will be where the Hawd is going to be situated and there does not appear to be anything irrational about this interpretation another interpretation is that worshipping there or Ibadah will lead you to one of the gardens of Jannah so if this is the interpretation that is taken then it would be similar to the Prophet saying وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ الْجَنَّةَ تَحْتَ ظِلَالِ السُّيُوفِ know that Jannah is under the shades of the swords what that means is that fighting in the way of Allah Jalla wa ala leads to Jannah likewise when the Prophet told us that Jannah is beneath the feet of the mother what does that mean? it means being in the service of your mother leads to Jannah so these three narrations are if you like cut from the same cloth a third interpretation is that because this is a place in which much ibadah takes place then the Malaika descend into this place and much mercy and Sakina descends into this place thus making it resemble one of the gardens of Jannah where there is Sakina and peace and happiness so these are three interpretations the next chapter about Mount Uhud from Abu Humaid radiallahu an he says we went out for the military expedition of Tabuk and he narrates the whole narration and in it he says we came to Wadi al qura which is situated between Medina and Syria and the Prophet said I am hurrying forward so whoever wants to keep up with me let him do so but whoever wants to bide his time then let him do so he said we left until we could see Medina in our sights and the Prophet said هذه طابة وهذا أحد وهو جبل يحبنا ونحبه he said this is طابة referring to Medina this is one of the names of Al Medina طابة and he says this is Uhud it is a mountain who loves us and we love it so we take from this narration that Baba is one of the names of Al-Madina like we said before and we learn that Uhud is a mountain who loves so 
a mountain can actually love in a way that is fitting to a mountain. We do not really understand how this all manifests. But when he says loves us, who is us? Is it the Sahaba or all of the Muslimin, including us today? This is a debatable point. One might say that Uhud loves every mu'min because anyone who has Iman is worthy to be loved. Or one could argue the other way and say that this applies only to the Sahaba because they are the ones who fought at the Battle of Uhud and they are the ones who suffered the loss. It was not just any old mu'min. As for us loving Uhud, then this is clearer. Yes, the Prophet and the companions loved Uhud. Well, we love Uhud as well particularly because there was a blessing, even if the Muslimin lost the Battle of Uhud, but there were 70 shuhada created at the Battle of Uhud. And in loss, there is still benefit. Let's look at the next chapter about the merit of praying in the Masjid al-Haram from Abu Hurairah. That the Prophet said, Salatun fi masjidi hadha afdalu min alfi salatin fi ma siwahu illa al-masjid al-Haram. A prayer in my masjid here is better than a thousand prayers elsewhere except the al-masjid al-haram and in another wording it says illa masjid al-ka'aba except the masjid of the ka'aba so we take from this that the prophet's masjid is the most virtuous of the masajid except for the al-masjid al-haram in Mecca and this is the particular masjid here not just any masjid in the haram and yet despite this we have to say that the sunnah is most worthy to be followed so if the Prophet told us that the nafila Salah, is better prayed at home, then it is better to pray that at home rather than in the masjid, although it is still permissible to be prayed in the masjid. In another wording of the chapter, the Prophet says, فَإِنِّي آخِرُ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ وَإِنَّ مَسْجِدِي آخِرُ الْمَسَاجِدِ I am the last of the Prophets and my masjid is the last of the masajid. What does it mean to say last of the masajid? Clearly there are masajid built after. The Prophet's Masjid. The intended meaning here is that this is the last Masjid built by a Prophet. Because of course if the Prophet is the last Prophet then there can be no other Prophet after him and consequently there can be no Prophet to build a Masjid. And this leads us to the next discussion point which is which is more virtuous Medina or Mecca? And the answer is that the Haram of Mecca is the most sacred place. The Prophet himself admits as much authentically in At-Tirmidhi where he says Wallahi innaki la khayru ardillahi wa ahabbu ardillahi ilallah By Allah you, talking to Mecca, are the best of the lands of Allah and the most beloved land to Allah Walawla anni ukhrijtu minki ma kharajt If it were not for the case that I had been driven out from you, I would not have left you Let's take the next chapter about traveling to a masjid from Abu Huraira, the Prophet said, لا تشد الرحال إلا إلى ثلاثة مساجد مسجدي هذا ومسجد الحرام ومسجد الأقصى He says that traveling for a masjid is not to be done except for three. This masjid of mine, the masjid al-haram and the masjid al-aqsa. That is in Jerusalem. We learn from this narration that you are not allowed to travel to pay homage to a particular place except for these three masajid. Now of course you can travel for permissible actions and purposes such as trade, such as seeking knowledge and studying and even let's say visiting the ill. But this is traveling for a particular action, not for a particular place. And we might also take from this that it is not permissible to have as your intention that you're going to visit the grave of the Prophet ﷺ when you go for the Hajj and you want to visit al Medina. Rather the intention is that you want to pray in the Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi. Of course you can visit the grave, but this must not be part of your intention which makes you set out on a journey. You're not allowed to set out on a journey to visit any grave. Can you set out to go to a grave in order to pray the Salat Al-Janazah? This is permissible because you're not intending the grave per se, rather you are intending the Salat Al-Janazah. And so notice the difference. So this narration is talking about acts of ibadah by visiting a particular place. So for example, is it permissible to travel out intending to visit Mount Uhud because it's obviously an historical place 
Well, the answer is, if it is by way of ta'abud as an act of ibadah, then no, it is not permissible because of this hadith. But if you set out to a place for educational purposes or to visit a particular place due to its historical significance, not as an act of ibadah or ta'abud, then that is permissible because these are just from the permissible activities of life. Let's take a look at the next chapter about the masjid that was founded on taqwa. Abu Salama ibn Abdurrahman reports that Abdurrahman ibn Abi Sa'id al-Khudri passed by him. Of course, he's the son of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. And I asked him, did you hear your father mentioning the masjid that was founded on taqwa? He says, yes, my father said, I went to the Messenger of Allah and he was in the house of one of his wives and I said, O Messenger of Allah, which of the two masajid is founded on taqwa? Thereupon the Prophet took a handful of pebbles and he threw them on the ground and he said, Huwa masjidukum hadha, meaning to say the al-masjid al-nabawi. The narrator says, I bear witness that I heard your father mentioning it. This narration points out to us the importance of knowing the narrations and that the ayat of the Qur'an do not always tell you what they are referring to. You need the narrations. There is no other ayat in the Qur'an which tells us which masjid is being referred to when he says la masjidun ussisa ala taqwa min awwal yawmin ahaqqu an taqwuma fi. We learn from this narration that it is al-masjid al-nabawi and not masjid al-quba. Similarly, when Allah Jalla wa'ala says in Surah Al-Tahrim, Ya ayyuhu al-nabiyu lima tuharrimu ma ahalla Allahu laka tabdaghi mardat azwajik. Why are you making haram for yourself, that which is halal, only seeking the pleasure of your wives? And the question is, what is being referred to here? Well, the answer is, we do not actually know, because no other ayah of the Qur'an helps us. So we have to look at the narrations. This is the importance of narrations. And also, the narration of Aisha, which we discussed, pertaining to the importance of making the sa'i between the Safa and Marwa. The narrations are all important. And many scholars also say that it encompasses both masajid. They are both built upon taqwa from the first day. There is another narration in the collection of Ibn Khuzayma, which says that the Prophet referred to the people of the Masjid Quba, telling them that Allah praises them in Surat At-Tawbah suggesting to us that the masjid being referred to is the one at Quba. The problem with that narration is that it is not Sahih. And the Sahih narration that we have is this one in Sahih Muslim. So this is the one we give weight to. As for the background of this ayah, then we refer the listener to the tafsir of Surah At-Tawbah, ayah 108. Let's move to the last chapter of this book of Hajj, which is the fadila of the Masjid Quba. From Ibn Umar, he reports that the Prophet would visit Masjid Quba riding and on foot. So sometimes he would ride and sometimes he would walk. Also in the chapter, Ibn Umar reports that the Prophet visited Masjid Quba, be it riding or on foot, and he prayed two rak'at of nafila. In an authentic report in Sunan Ibn Majah, the Prophet said, Man tathahara fi baytihi thumma atta Masjid Quba فَصَلَّ فِيهِ صَلَاةً كَانَ لَهُ كَأَجْرِ عُمْرَةً Whoever makes wudu in his house, makes bahara that is, and then he comes to Masjid Quba and prays in it, he will have the reward the like of an umrah. So we find there is great virtue in praying in Masjid Quba. Again, the point is you do not set out on a journey for this masjid. But if you are going to visit Medina, your intention is the Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi. Then from there, you can go out to Masjid Quba and that's not a problem. You may visit the grave of the Prophet, and that is not a problem. But from when you set off, your intention needs to be Al-Masjid al-Nabawi. Also in the chapter, the Prophet did this every Saturday. The reason for Saturday, it appears, is that on Friday, he would have been praying Salat al-Jumu'ah in his Masjid. And so the next day, he would come to Masjid Quba to give a share of his Salah in that Masjid as well. That was the Masjid made even before Masjid al-Nabawi. As for the reward of the Umrah, then one may speculate as to why it is that reward. The point is, it's that reward, and that's all we need to know. Okay, let's take some review questions. So question number one. In a case of a necessity, how long can you stay in the place you left for the sake of Allah? Meaning, you made hijrah from for the sake of Allah. And furnish your answer with evidence. Question number two. 
Do we have any evidence that a hadith were written down during the lifetime of the Prophet? Question number three. The narration about the masjid built upon taqwa highlights the importance of a hadith and narrations in understanding the Quran properly. Explain how this is so and give at least two more examples to illustrate this importance.